Hello everyone, welcome to the next installment, this time on the Greek sea, Poseidon, sea deities, and the Greek monsters. For a good epigraph to this lecture, we can look to the blurb in Marie Claire Boileau's excellent book, The Sea and the Greek Imagination. The sea is omnipresent in Greek life. Visible from nearly everywhere, the sea represents the life and the livelihood of many who dwell on the islands and the coastal areas of the Mediterranean. And it has been so since long ago. The sea loomed large in the Homeric epics and throughout Greek mythology. The Greeks of antiquity turned to the sea for food and for transport, for war, commerce, and scientific advancement, and for religious purification and other rites. Yet the sea was simultaneously the center of Greek life and its limit. For while the sea was giver of much, it also embodied danger and uncertainty. It was in turns barren and fertile, and pictured both as a roadway and a terrifying void. More than a simple physical boundary, the sea represented the buffer zone between the imaginary and the real, the transitional space between the worlds of the living, the dead and the gods. Our textbook provides what could be another epigraph for this lecture, again from Pisanias' travelogue, where he notes three key epithets of the god Poseidon. By the harbor, there is a temple of Poseidon, and a freestanding statue of stone. In addition to the many names that have been fashioned by the poets for Poseidon as an adornment of their verses, and those names which custom has established for each particular community, the epithets of the god that all men use are Pelagaios, god of the sea, Asphaleos, god of security, and Hippios, god of horses. We'll get into the god Poseidon and his relation to security and horses later in the lecture, but let's begin now by looking a bit more into the most famous epithet of Poseidon, Pelagaios, god of the sea. And here we can turn to the opening of Hodelin's great elegy, the Archipelago. Note the term Pelagaios in the second half of the word. Hodelin begins, Are the cranes returning to you and the mercantile vessels making again for your shores? Do breezes longed for and prayed for blow for you round the quieter flood and lured from beneath it? Does the dolphin now warm his back in the new year's gathering radiance? Is Ionia in flower? Is it in season? For always in springtime, when the hearts of the living renew themselves, the first love of humankind reawakens, stirs, and the golden age is remembered. You, old sea god, I visit, and you I greet in your stillness. Hodelin's longest and most masterful elegy goes on to describe the way of life of early seafaring Greeks and their relationship to the sea, precisely in these regions that you see here in the map of the Archipel or Archipelagos. Here in this satellite image, this region known as the Aegean Sea. The Ionian Sea also has much sea mythology and Poseidon mythology associated with it. In mentioning the city of Ionia that's in flower, Hodelin probably means the Ionian city-states over here. The archipelago, or beautiful collection of Greek islands in the Aegean Sea. Is the old sea god that Hodelin sings Poseidon? Most likely yes, probably with other sea gods in mind as well, and we'll be sure to explore most of them in this lecture. We don't have time to interpret Hedelin's archipelago hymn in detail, but we can say with Heidegger's 1941 lecture series that reared on war and festival, struggle and celebration, the Greeks in Hedelin's elegy are configured as the fervent or intimate people, das innige Volk. That is, as a people who endure the counter-striving of all that is harmoniously opposed as the supreme force of their existence. This alone goes a long way to account for the forcefulness of Greek myth. And Heidegger here recalls the saying of Sophocles in the second choral ode of Antigone, Manifold is the uncanny, or terrible, or monstrous, yet nothing more uncannily looms or stirs beyond the human being. The term in Sophocles' Greek that is being translated here by Heidegger as looming or stirring is the word pelai, same word in Poseidon's epithet Pelagaios, and in the name of the Greek islands of the Aegean Sea. What does this word mean in Greek? and in the opening lines of Hodelin's elegy. For Heidegger, what it denotes is a kind of security or safety in play. Pelai denotes the concealed presencing of stillness and tranquility, precisely amidst the appearing of overwhelming change. And so the Pelai in the very title archipelago denotes an originary looming, stirring, or playing forth, originary from the term arca and playing forth from Pelai. The word Pelai is old and means to stir, to come forth, 
to find and abide in one's locale and site. And most interestingly, in Homer and Hesiod, Peline is the usual word for eni or being. The archaic Greeks do not speak like the later pre-Socratics of being or to be in the abstract, but see it at work in the looming, stirring, or playing forth of the sea, above all in the image of Poseidon Pelagaios. And so Poseidon too here, like Hestia in the previous lecture, is in Heidegger's way of reading a god of being or a god of the myth of being. And this for Heidegger is what Hedelin's elegy sings forth. Indeed, by looking more closely into this Greek term Peline, we can find an explanation of the very spirit of the Greek islands. Peline means to emerge, to come forth of its own accord and thus to presence, like each of the islands in their rich traditions. O Pelas, in fact, can mean the neighbor who has his presence in the immediate vicinity, which here could mean the other and kindred islands that are nearby. Pelagos itself, the word we find in Archipelagos, that which stirs itself of its own accord and does not flow away, but remains and abides within its surging. And Pelagos is thus another word for the sea. Heidegger concludes this brief interpretation. Hedelin's most sublime elegy bears the title the Archipelagus, meaning here the Aegean Sea, and the elegy closes with the following appeal. Yet you, immortally, though even the Greek song itself no longer celebrates you as before, from your waves, O god of sea. Although Poseidon is the best known of the great gods of the waters in general and of the sea in particular, he is by no means the first or only such divinity. In what follows, we'll be looking into the genealogy of Pontus, the first sea, child of Gaia, who mates with Gaia, to give birth to Nereus, who is the first old man of the sea god, among many other more monstrous children, as we'll see. Nereus ends up with Doris and Okeanid, and from here, 50 Nereids are born, most worthy of study being Thetis, Galatea, and Amphitrite. And from the union of Okeanus and Tethys, the first Titan, we get the Okeanids. Hesiod names 41 of these, but there are many, many more. And so far, by way of introduction, this makes at least four to five truly major sea deities we'll have to look into, as well as over a hundred plus more minor sea deities. And here we'll be looking into just a few. Since Nereus is the eldest sea god in Hesiod's genealogy, let's start with the Orphic hymn to Nereus. The sea's foundation are your realm, an abode of glossy blackness, and you exult in the beauty of your fifty daughters as they dance amid the waves. O Nereus, god of great renown, foundation of the sea, end of earth, beginning of all, you make Demeter's sacred throne tremble, when you imprison the gusty winds driven to your gloomy depth. But, O blessed one, ward off earthquakes and send to the initiates peace, prosperity, and gentle-handed health. Other than the fifty daughters, the Nereids, this could well be a hymn to Poseidon, the function of these two gods often being syncretized in the Greek religious imagination. But note in the Orphic poet's rendition how the very deepest part, the depth of the sea, or the earlier sea god in glossy blackness, is emphasized. Foundation of the sea, end of earth, and rather than pursue the goddess of nature and the grain, Demeter, as will Poseidon, Nereus simply makes Demeter tremble from the gloomy depth of a distance, from which he proves to be a beneficent god, imprisoning the gusty winds, warding off earthquakes and sending initiates peace, prosperity, and health. The fifty Nereids, children of Nereus and Doris, have proved, like much of Greek sea mythology, to be a favorite theme in Western painting. We'll see the origin of this with Raphael's depiction of Galatea in a minute. Although often confused with the Okeanids, the Nereids appear to be the most archaic mermaids or sea goddesses in Greek myth, and several of them will be important for the overall coherence of the pantheon. The later Orphic hymn to the Nereids emphasizes their nymphic nature, O lovely and pure-faced nymphs, daughters of Nereus who live in the deep. At the bottom of the sea you gamble and dance in the water, Fifty maidens reveling in the waves, maidens riding on the back of tritons, delighting in animal shapes and bodies nurtured by the sea. Your home is the water and you leap and whirl round the waves like glistening dolphins roving the roaring seas. I call upon you to bring much prosperity to the initiates, for you were the first to know the holy rite of sacred Bacchus and of pure Persephone, you and Calliope and Apollon the Lord. Triton, as we'll see, is the divine son of Poseidon and Amphitrite, who in later Orphic thought seems to take over the post of choral leader or Corugetos of the Nereids, much as Apollo is the choral leader of the Muses. 
in the Orphic way of thinking, the rites of sacred Bacchus and of pure Persephone, the two greatest savior gods of humanity, was either already known by the Nereids, or they themselves were the first to learn it. In this way, the Orphic poet associates the Nereids with the function of salvation and a festive play, the ecstasy of the dance, and the liberation of the soul in the afterlife in the holy groves of Persephone. Perhaps this is an invention of the Orphics, or perhaps the Nereids in very distant times performed similar functions in myth. Again, the three important Nereids we'll be looking more into are Thetis, Amphitrite, and Galatea. We've already met Thetis in the lecture on Prometheus, where she was the Nereid prophesied by Gaia and Uranus to bear a son stronger than either Zeus's lightning bolt or Poseidon's trident. Invariably in Greek myth, she's portrayed as the most beautiful of the Nereids. And her central myth ends up being the myth of her marriage to Peleus, the mortal man. Thetis tried to evade this marriage to Peleus at first by changing shape like the old men of the sea. But the destiny decreed by the Olympians was not to be evaded. She relented and bore to Peleus the greatest of all heroes, Achilles, but then eventually left him. The most important scene in her myth is the very wedding ceremony itself, which is thought by all subsequent Greeks to be the very first wedding of an immortal goddess and a mortal man. Of course, we know from last week that the marriage of Zeus and Hera was the first wedding festival attended by all the gods, but the wedding of Thetis and Peleus is the first wedding modeled on this theme between an immortal goddess and a mortal man. And so we could say the second wedding that all the gods attended, just like the nymph Chelene was tardy in attending the wedding of Hera and Zeus, although invited, here it is Eris who's the only immortal goddess not invited. So she drops in among the wedding guests anyway, throwing into the festivities a golden apple with the inscription to the fairest. This of course sets up the squabble of Hera, Aphrodite, and Athena, and thus sets in motion the events that led to the Trojan War, in which Thetis' son Achilles will be most glorified, but also fated to an early death. Hera herself speaks of the wedding of Thetis and Peleus in Homer's Iliad, the company of the gods, about the immortal Achilles as child of the goddess, and she reminds the gods of the wedding of Thetis and Peleus, for you all went, you gods, to the wedding, and notes that she, Hera herself, had nurtured Thetis and brought her up, and been instrumental in giving her as a bride to her husband Peleus. Keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer, I guess. Although Roberto Colasso's book, The Marriage of Cadmus and Harmony, gets its title from a later sacred wedding of an immortal goddess and a mortal man, Cadmus and Harmony, the structure of his narrative is more based on this earlier wedding of Thetis and Peleus than anything else. We hear regarding this event in Hesiod's Catalogue of Women. For in common then were the banquets, and in common the seats of deathless gods and mortal men. This was in Colasso's term the age of conviviality, or even of a lack of boundaries between the world of the gods and that of men. The wedding of Thetis and Peleus is the scene of divine mortal conviviality itself, just prior in Colasso's retelling to the emergence of the regime of rape, but still bearing a few of its telltale signs such as Thetis' reluctance to marry a mortal man. The second centrally important Nereid is Amphitrite, who becomes the wife of Poseidon, and bears to him the child Triton, the greatest merman of Greek mythology who blows the conch shell and also has the power of changing his shape, like the earlier Nereus or later Proteus. We read last week in Hesiod's Theogony how, from the union of rumbling Poseidon and Amphitrite, came the great Triton, whose might is far-flung, an awesome god dwelling in a golden house that lies at the sea's bottom, very near his cherished mother and lordly father. This theme of a golden house, castle, or palace at the sea's bottom we'll see come up again and again in Greek sea myth. Sometimes mortal heroes try to dive down very deep to find these locales. Nereus has a palace at the deepest point of the sea's foundation, and so do as we now hear Poseidon and his son Triton. These are the gods of the original underwater poli, we could say. The goddess Amphitrite becomes in Greek mythology the very queen of the sea, and the leader of both the Nereids, herself being one, and of the Okeanids, much as Triton becomes the leader of them all. In a later myth in Hyginus we hear that when Poseidon first sought Amphitrite's hand in marriage, 
she fled his advances and hid herself away near Atlas in the ocean stream at the far ends of the earth. It was the dolphin god Delphin who eventually tracked her down and persuaded her to return to wed the Sea King. Amphitrite's main Homeric epithet seems to be Halo Sudne, which means sea nourished, and Pindar calls her the goddess of the golden spindle, perhaps thereby associating her with fate or anarchy. And in later sea lore to the present, she's often syncretized with the goddess Thalassa, goddess of the sea. On the wedding of Poseidon and Amphitrite, the textbook notes that it's much like the marriage of Zeus and Hera, and it's even a bit like that of Persephone and Hades. In the first comparison, Poseidon has a weakness for women, and Amphitrite with good cause is angry and vengeful. In the second comparison, Amphitrite like Persephone was an unwilling bride, who had to be pursued and forced into the marriage. While Triton is their most important child, they had many others, but they don't play much of a role in Greek myth, so we won't cover them here. Eventually in Greek and Roman art, Tritons became merely decorative, signifying any kind of merman, usually with a nereid riding on his back. The tradition of depicting the marriage of Poseidon and Amphitrite on vase paintings or stucco walls goes very far back, and this as well became a favorite theme in the modern history of painting especially after Nicolas Poussin presented this theme, partly an answer to Raphael's Galatea fresco. That's the exquisite canvas you see here on the left, and you can read the textbook interpretation that wherever the Nereids or the marriage of Poseidon and Amphitrite are portrayed, the emotional tone of the whole is one of exuberant joy. Even in book illustrations or more kitschy depictions, Poseidon is often portrayed alongside Amphitrite and his son, and sometimes with his conch-blowing son in the distance performing in some ways the role of his herald. Galatea, the next Nereid we're looking into, was loved by the Cyclops Polyphemus, a son of Poseidon, and Thusa, a somewhat monstrous sea nymph, Raphael's finless and fancy-free Galatea, from 1512 seems to have inaugurated the renewed obsession in Western painting with Greek sea deities, Raphael's Galatea becoming one of the most iconic and well-known works in Western art. It could well be that this Renaissance obsession with Greek sea deities occurred because it was easier to assimilate them to the tradition of Christianized angels or cherubs, the original Greek erotes, and so easier for the painter to celebrate God's creation without unduly focusing on other divine figures who might prove to have more challenging implications. Ovid's account of Galatea and Polyphemus is the most well-known, and he plays on the comical contrast of the monstrous Cyclops on the one hand and the delicate nymph on the other. Repelled by Polyphemus' attentions, Galatea loved Assis, who was the handsome son of Faunus and a sea nymph. Overcome by emotion, Polyphemus attempted to mend his savage ways, combing his hair with a rake and cutting his beard with a scythe, after which he sat on the cliff of a promontory that jutted out into the sea where he would take his pipe of the hundred reeds and sing love songs to Galatea. Galatea, making love in rapturous embrace to her Assis, would hear Polyphemus' song, which described her beauty, lamented her adamant rejection of him, and offered her many a rustic gift. Since the textbook gives us the end of this myth from Ovid, I thought it would be more interesting here to go to its earlier source. In the 3rd century BCE Greek poet Theocritus, his 11th idol relating the myth of Galatea and Polyphemus is not only a lot earlier, but it's a lot funnier and I think more beautiful than Ovid's version. Theocritus' version, Idol 11, is known as the Cyclops Serenade. I'll just read it to you here and interpret it after. O oh my white Galatea, why do you spurn your lover? Whiter to look at than cream cheese, softer than a lamb, more playful than a calf, sleeker than an unripe grape. Why do you only come as sweet sleep claims me? Why do you leave me as sweet sleep lets me go? Fleeing like a ewe at the sight of a gray wolf. I fell in love with you, my sweet, when first you came with my mother to gather flowers of hyacinth on the mountain and I was your guide. From the day I set eyes on you up to this moment, I've loved you without a break, but you care nothing, nothing at all. I know, my beautiful girl, why you run from me. A shaggy brow spreads right across my face, from ear to ear in one unbroken line. Below is a single eye, and above a broad flat nose. Such may be my looks. But I pasture a thousand beasts, and I drink the best milk I get from them, Cheese, too, I have in abundance, in summer and autumn, and even at winter's end, my racks are always laden, and I can pipe better than any cyclops here, when I sing my sweet pippin deep in the night of you and me, 
For you I'm rearing eleven fawns, all marked on their necks, and four bear cubs too. Oh, please come, won't you come? You'll see that life is just as good if you leave the grey-green sea behind to crash on the shore, and at night you will find more joy in this cave with me. Here there are bays, and here are slender cypresses. Here is somber ivy, and the vine's sweet fruit. Here there is ice-cold water, which dense wooded Etna sends from its white snows, a drink fit for the gods, who could prefer waves of the sea to all that I have to offer. But if you think I'm a touch too hairy for you, I have oak logs here, and under the ash, unflagging fire. Burn away my life with fire, I could bear even that, and my single eye, my one dearest possession of all. I wish my mother had given me gills when I was born. Then I would have dived down to kiss your hand if you had refused your mouth, and brought you white snowdrops or delicate poppies with their scarlet pearls. One grows in summer, and the other grows in winter. It's not too late, my dear, for me to learn to swim. If only some mariner would sail his ship here, then I could fathom why you nymphs love life in the deep. Come out, Galatea, come out, and forget your home. Pretty hilarious serenade, right? So before reading the very interesting concluding stanza, just a few remarks. This being a bucolic poem, and Polyphemus, a committed pastoralist, of course in the first stanza he can't help but compare her to all his favorite rustic things. Note how the poet is ambiguous. Galatea only comes to Polyphemus when he is asleep, which could mean in his dreams, or it could mean she's having an affair with him, and is really drawn in by this stuff, despite her best judgment. What Polyphemus has is perhaps a vision of Galatea, but one that dissolves in the day, fleeing like a ewe at the first sight of a grey wolf. In the second stanza we learn how Polyphemus met Galatea. His own mother, Thusa, a sea goddess, was gathering flowers with Galatea, and Polyphemus was their guide. Polyphemus falls instantly and hopelessly in love, but knows that as a cyclops, he's not exactly her type. Hilariously, he goes on to make a fair bit of fun of himself, not without noting all the great gifts he can provide to a potential wife, milk and cheese and meat, and music and fawns and even bear cubs. In the fourth stanza, he begins to beg, promising Galatea that life is better on land than at sea, especially because of his cave, the beautiful trees, and the fresh as opposed to briny water, the purest being that gathered from snow on a mountain peak. In the fifth stanza, he simply doesn't understand how anyone, even a Nereid, could prefer the sea to his own bucolic existence. Polyphemus will preserve the fire, the hearth flame, and of course protect his would-be watery bride from the flames, even if he has to sacrifice himself, but that probably won't be necessary, since his great cyclops eye will always keep an eye on the fire knowing that he might have just scared the sea nymph a bit with the very idea of his hearth fire. He tries another tact, wishing he'd been given gills so he can go to her, bringing her two of the greatest gifts of the land, summer's and winter's fruit, intoxicating poppies and ice cream, you could say. And he promises that if she's not won over yet, he will learn to swim and take up with Mariner so he learns to love her way of life too. Come out, Galatea, come out and forget your home. And he goes on, follow the shepherd's life with me, milking and setting cheese. And in conclusion, rather than blame Galatea for her lack of interest, Polyphemus claims that it's his own mother, Thusa, who's to blame and who does him wrong, since she's never spoken a gentle word to you, Galatea, about me. Although she sees me wasting away day by day, I'll see she knows how my head and feet throb with pain so that her torment will be equal to what I suffer. Not very attractive there, Polyphemus threatening to punish your own mother in lieu of a woman's rejection. At this point, the serenade ends, and Polyphemus turns his wisdom towards healing himself. Oh, Cyclops, Cyclops, where have your wits flown to? Show some sense. Go and weave some baskets and collect green shoots for the lambs. Milk the ewe at hand. Why chase one who runs away? Maybe you'll find another Galatea, and a prettier one too. I am invited out for nighttime play by lots of girls. And they giggle together as soon as they see that I've heard. On land too, I am clearly a man of some consequence. And so by singing, the Cyclops shepherded his love and more relief it brought him than by paying a large fee. Theocritus's advice to Polyphemus or his advice to himself is more or less that a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush and also that he should control himself Loving Galatea was a lot like making himself sick and so having to pay a doctor, or perhaps a prostitute, a large fee, 
when really all Polyphemus needed to do was to shepherd his love and attain inner serenity. Theocritus's Idol 11 is really very charming and funny, and also quite deep. It, even more than Ovid's account, serves as the text for some of the deepest meditations on the Polyphemus theme in Western art, such as in these canvases by Gustave Moreau and Odillon Redon. You'll be glad to hear that in some versions of the myth, Polyphemus manages to win Galatea over in the end, as you see here on the left. Ovid's version, in which he jealously murders Assis, turning him into a river god, is a far less pleasing outcome for such a charming cyclops. In any case, in the more believable version of the myth, abandoned by Galatea, he is eventually tricked and blinded by Odysseus, the very event that sparks Poseidon's rage against Odysseus, and so sets up his long and grueling nostos, or return home. If the charming character of Polyphemus interests you for an essay, I would recommend picking up Charles Segal's book, Poetry and Myth in the Ancient Pastoral, Essays on Theocritus and Virgil. While Theocritus' version of the Polyphemus myth, definitely the best, here's one that's maybe even funnier. Once upon a time, there was a cyclops named Polyphemus who was in love with a young girl named Galatia. If only Galatia loved me. How? How could she choose that fool over me? Over me? I've got it. Phoenix did everything to show Galatia how much she loved her, but oftentimes he just embarrassed himself. Galatia, I'm going to sing you a song. Galatia, how could you choose him over me? Oh what are you doing? Galatia, I thought I was just for thee. I really want you. Oh I really what want you. You are my everything. Galatia, how could you choose him over me? <laughs> <laughs> She never took Polyphemus seriously, and it's often turned to anger. If anybody would like to reenact this myth for their creative project at the end of the semester, please do so. YouTube clearly needs it. Those being the three most important nereids, Thetis, Amphitrite, and Galatea, our next brief stop is the later and often more prominent old man of the sea, Proteus. In the Iliad and the Odyssey, Proteus is the sea shepherd of Poseidon, and sometimes in later myth, his son. His myths across the Greek canon are very consistent. He is the prophetic old man of the sea, or Halios Geron, and his special power is to see through the whole depth of the sea, and also to tend the flocks or seals of Poseidon. Like Nereus or other Nereids, he has the ability to change shape at will, and more even than Nereus, he has a long esoteric afterlife in Western culture and religion, due in part to his very evocative name, Proteus, and in part to how well known his myth became from both Homer and Virgil. It is Menelaus who captures Proteus after the Trojan War, rushing upon him with a shout and throwing his arms around him. But the old man did not forget his devious arts. First, he became a thickly maned lion, and then a serpent, a leopard, and a great boar. At last he became liquid water, and a tree with lofty branches. But Menelaus and his men held him firm with steadfast spirits, upon which he answered all of Menelaus' questions regarding the tragedies that would befall the Aetian Greeks in their return home. The description of Proteus's transformations into four great beasts, lion, serpent, leopard, and boar, and also into water and a tree, perhaps an anima mundi image, likely goes very far back in Indo-European consciousness of natural metamorphosis, and contributes to the great reputation and fame of Proteus in later Western esotericism, from medieval alchemy to Marc Chagall. The Orphic Hymn to Proteus is itself one of the most esoteric of the Orphic Hymns, and I just got my microphone adjusted for this, so hopefully it sounds a little better. I call upon Proteus, key-holding, master of the sea, firstborn who showed the beginnings of all nature, changing matter into a great variety of forms. 
The epithet key holding is significant due to Proteus's role in initiatory ritual. Proteus, we might say, is ritually closer to mankind than Nereus, for it is he who shows the beginnings of all nature and her transformations. Honored by all, Proteus is wise and knows, as the prophetic formula goes, what is now, what was before, and what will be. And the Orphics go on to most closely associate Proteus with metamorphosis or transformation, even suggesting that nature or phusis is most intensely expressed in this god. So having covered a few background deities in Greek sea myth, and before moving on to the darker aspects of the sea, the generation of the monsters, let's say a few words about Poseidon, who, under the new Olympian administration, defined by Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus, assumes the role of king of everything watery or oceanic. As the textbook notes, Poseidon is similar in appearance to Zeus, a majestic bearded figure, but is generally more severe and rough. And besides, he carries the trident, a three-pronged fork resembling a fisherman's spear. Poseidon is positively ferocious in myth. He is called, like Nereus, a supporter of the earth, but the earth shaker as well. And as the god of earthquakes, he exhibits his violence by the rending of land and the surging of the sea. Recall how in Colasso's tale of Minoan civilization, at the beginning, Minos summons Poseidon's white bull up out of the sea. Poseidon's conflictual relationship with Minos, himself a son of Zeus, as well as Poseidon's spiritual fathership of Theseus becoming important themes. In somewhat later myth, it is Poseidon's relentless anger against Odysseus for the blinding of his son Polyphemus that provides the dominant theme for the Odyssey. Other than the epithets covered at the beginning of this lecture, Pelagaios, Asphaleos, and Hippios, god of the sea, security, and horses, his most common descriptive epithets are dark-maned, and the breaking waves he stirs up are white-capped. The Homeric hymn to Poseidon sings about Poseidon, a great god, the shaker of the earth and of the barren sea, ruler of the deep and also over Mount Helicon and the broad town of Aegea, that is, the earlier Athens. Double honor the gods have allotted to you, O earth shaker, to be both a tamer of horses and a savior of ships. Hail, dark-haired Poseidon, who surrounds the earth, and O blessed God, be of kind heart and protect those who sail your waters. The connection of Poseidon to both Mount Helicon in Boeotia and to a more ancient Athens are significant. The Homeric hymn most underlines what almost appears to be a paradox. Why is the god of the sea, the savior of the ships, also a tamer of horses? What is the connection of Poseidon to the land? Does this reflect Poseidon's earlier divine career? Before the triumph of the Olympians in the Titanomachy and Gigantomachy and redistribution of power, the Orphic hymn to Poseidon sings, Harkon, dark-maned Poseidon, holder of the earth, equestrian, carved in bronze is the trident in your hand, and you dwell in the foundations of the full-bosomed sea. Deep-roaring ruler of the sea and shaker of the earth, your blossoms are waves, O gracious one, as you urge horses and chariots on. Rushing on the sea and splashing through the rippling brine, to your lot fell the third portion, the unfathomable sea, and you delight in waves and in their wild dwellers, O spirit of the deep. Save the foundations of the earth and ships moving at full tilt, the Orphic hymn as well underlining the double nature of Poseidon as god of horses and the sea, and perhaps providing an explanation of the transition from the first Poseidon, lord of the earth, to the second when it sings, to your lot fell the third portion. Due to the paradoxical double nature of this god, the origins of Poseidon have been much disputed. Is his trident, in fact, the triformal thunderbolt? A sign that he was earlier a sky god who had come to earth? In the Mycenaean Linear B tablets, it does appear that Poseidon is the chief deity, a god of earth, or as the textbook says, a male spirit of fertility. And this fits well with his association with horses and bulls and also explains some of the characters of his affairs. We'll be returning to this Poseidon when we study the Homeric hymn to Apollo. Now recall how Hades was born first, then Poseidon and then Zeus in Hesiod's Theogony. Hades can't marry Hestia because she's a virginal goddess, so Zeus gives him Persephone instead. Zeus marries Hera, so you might think that a natural pairing would be for Poseidon to marry Demeter, the god of the sea and of horses entering into a hierogamy with the goddess of grain, nature, and the mysteries. As it turns out, there is a myth where Poseidon mates with Demeter in the form of a stallion. 
He pursued her while she was searching for her daughter, and her ruse of changing into a mare to escape him was to no avail. This scene is calculated and chilling in its implications. Zeus has just arranged the marriage to Hades by rape of Persephone. And now, while Demeter is confused and wandering the countryside looking for her lost daughter, this is when Poseidon takes his opportunity to have a go at the goddess of nature herself? The iniquity suffered by Demeter knows no bounds, and there's also an Orphic myth in which Zeus rapes Demeter in the form of entwined serpents, himself becoming the father of Persephone, his daughter, who he in turn couples with, producing the god Dionysus. As we've seen, ignoring the rape motifs is fairly common in Western art, but in the case of this obscure coupling of Poseidon with Demeter, artists seem positively enthralled to completely overlook the dark underpinnings as in these two images. In part, the mistreatment of Demeter is what accounts for her continuing prominence in Eleusinian mystery cult and her rebellion against the iniquities of the Olympian order, as we'll cover in our unit on Demeter. The child born by Demeter to Poseidon ends up being Despoina, a goddess of the mysteries, especially in Arcadia, and we'll have to return to her as well. Poseidon's most politically important myth is that he is virtually the shadow father of Theseus, and also closely associated with Theseus's father, Aegeus, from which the Aegean Sea and the land around Athens gets its name. Oilu points to an interesting myth, where the young prince of Athens, Theseus, calls for Minos to stop his advances, and suggests that he is Minos's equal in stature by virtue of being the son of Poseidon, while Minos is merely the son of Zeus. It was these mythic undercurrents that resulted in the dispute of Poseidon and Athena for the position of patron god of Athens. We'll be covering the Poseidon and Athena relationship more in the next lecture on Athena. Having covered the major and some of the more minor sea deities, who have more positive associations in Greek myth, and on the way to covering the darker aspects of the sea, the generation of Pontos and Gaia, the monsters, we can reflect briefly on the whole breadth of the sea. Again with Boilu, on its horizontal plane, the sea provides access to the ocean and the world beyond the mortal realm. On its vertical axis, the sea is also an intermediary between the worlds of the living, the dead and the gods. Indeed, the bottom of the sea houses the palace of Poseidon, Amphitrite, and the Nereids, as described by Bacchylides, also Triton. In fact, any marine deities, Nereus, Proteus, Thetis, Leucothea, are thought to live in the depth of the sea and may well come into contact with sailors in distress like Odysseus or Menelaus. The really interesting thing is that mortals can contact these sea deities deliberately by giving themselves over to the divinity and jumping into the sea. And this is how Theseus meets Amphitrite at the bottom of the sea and sees the palace of Poseidon, returning to the surface unscathed. Many other heroes do likewise, and in this way the sea is a space of communication between mortals and immortals. Mortals enter this realm very often at the very limits of their lives when they are about to face death. And here Boilu turns to the important theme of initiatory catapontismos, or descent into the sea, and the important connections of Poseidon cult with Hades cult. In fact, the vertical axis of the sea may lead to Hades altogether. Such a catabasis or descent is not uncommon in the realm of Poseidon. Many of his shrines and sacred groves, both on land and mythically in the sea, contain entrances to Hades. And so while Poseidon is not himself a divinity of the dead, in many locations he has dominion over the entrance to the underworld. The great scholar Verschnell notes that catapontismos and related types of death practically warrant heroization. And here again, Okeanus, Triton, Poseidon, Achelous, Nereus, or Proteus are often mythically indistinguishable. All of these gods might oversee the hero's narrative of marine initiation, death, and rebirth. Turning now to the more monstrous deities associated with the sea, we can begin with the myth of Scula and Charybdis. According to an obscure scolium on the Odyssey, which the textbook uses without citing, Scula's parents were interestingly Hecate and Forcus. Hecate being a key goddess we'll cover later, and Forcus the veritable father of the monsters. Poseidon made advances to Scula, who was originally very beautiful. Poseidon's wife Amphitrite became jealous and threw magic herbs into Scula's bathing place, and thus Scula was transformed into a terrifying monster encircled with a ring of dogs' heads. We can compare here Poseidon's rape of Medusa, or of Demeter, at the moment of her deepest distress. 
In Ovid's version, Medusa as well originally being very beautiful, but then in classic Greek victim blaming being transformed by the goddess Athena into a monster with a thousand snaky heads. Skula and Charybdis' most famous myth is found in the Odyssey where, after leaving Hades and passing by the Sirens, Odysseus has to struggle through the Straits of Skula. Skula's counterpart is here Charybdis, a daughter of Poseidon and Gaea and a formidable and voracious ally. And again, Charybdis was originally a beautiful nymph. But Zeus cast her into the sea by his thunderbolt and three times a day she draws in mountains of water and spews them out again. It is Virgil who identifies Skula's home as a cave in the Straits of Messina, nearby an occasional whirlpool that was potentially very dangerous for mariners. What is most significant about the myth of Skula and Charybdis is that they were initially not monsters at all, but were transformed into monsters under the curse of Poseidon or Zeus. The hero, modeling himself on Olympian power, has to traverse these dangers and suffer many losses, but is unable to slay these monsters their continued existence in the world being in some way God-sanctioned. In the Odyssey, the witch goddess Circe warns Odysseus about Skula, describing her in vividly misogynistic terms. Inside that cave lives Skula, yelping hideously. Her voice is no deeper than a young puppy's, but she herself is a fearsome monster. No one could see her and still be happy, not even a god who went that way. She has twelve feet all dangling down, six long necks with a grisly head on each one, and in each head a triple row of crowded and close-set teeth, fraught with black death. Sunk waist-deep in the cave's recesses, she still darts out her head from the frightening hollow, and there groping greedily round the rock, she fishes for dolphins or sharks or whatever beast more huge than these that she can seize upon from all the thousands that have their pasture in loud moaning Amphitrite. No seaman ever in any vessel has boasted of sailing that way unharmed, for with every single head of hers she snatches and carries off a man from the dark proud ship. As the textbook notes, Skula and Charybdis are above all a mythologization of the terrors faced by mariners when they sail through straits, and idiomatically at least, from the saying between Skula and Charybdis, we get the other folk adages such as out of the frying pan and into the fire or being between a rock and a hard place. Of course, Skula and Charybdis being far more terrifying. The vividness of these scenes, of course, assured their continuance in Western literature and art. In this interesting work on the left, a critique of the misogyny in this myth is implied. All the words on Skula's body and on Charybdis's body being associated in Western culture with the most negative aspects of the feminine, and the hero's journey through this peril being described as an adventurescape, a journey, risk, sacrifice, and loss. Many of the artistic attempts to depict Skula and Charybdis, of course, focus exclusively on their terrifying, monstrous aspect. While Skula and Charybdis become monsters, we might say on account of the injustices of Poseidon and Zeus, there is also a legitimate lineage of monsters in Greek thought, all of them in one way or another the descendants of Pontos and Gaia, and here we'll be returning to Hesiod's Theogony. What's interesting to note at the outset is that some of these children of Pontos and Gaia and their descendants have more positive association in myth and others more negative, again expressing the Greek mythological ambivalence about the sea. In Hesiod's Theogony, after the opening invocation to the Muses, and after singing the lineages of Chaos, Nyx, and Eris, including most of the spiritual evils in the world, Moros, Care, Sleep, Death, Distress, Woe, the Hesperides, Nemesis, Oath, Deception, Old Age, Work, Oblivion, Ruin, Famine, and many other baleful gods, including the earlier pre-Zeus Moirai, Hesiod then turns at line 233 to the lineage of Pontos. First positively, Pontos sired truthful Nereus, his oldest son, who tells no lies, and they call him the old man because he is honest and gentle and never forgetful of right, but ever mindful of just and genial thought. Then Pontos lay with Gaia and sired great Thaumas, Forcus, the overbearing, fair-cheeked Cato, and Eurybea, who in her breast has a heart of iron. Hesiod wants to give us the good news first, as it were, and goes on to demonstrate his great skills of memory in recounting the 41 Okeanids he can remember and all 50 Nereids. These children seem to be all light and play, whereas the children of Thaumas and Electra or of Forcus and Cato are either ambiguous or strictly monstrous. 
The god Thaumas, whose name means the wondrous, is obscure, but he becomes the father by the Okeanid Electra of Iris, the goddess of the rainbow, and the Harpies, the Snatchers, both winged deities. Eurybia is also obscure, but she becomes the mistress of the sea, and sometimes the mother with Creos, the titan, of the many great powers that preside at sea. The positive daughter of Thaumas and Electra, Iris, is described as swift, and the more negative daughters as lovely-haired. They are associated with sudden breezes and swoop down from high up in the sky to snatch their victims. Iris seems to have been a goddess of both sea and sky, getting her marine nature from Thaumas and her sky nature from Electra, whose name was associated with both amber and with clouds. For coastal dwelling creeks, the rainbow's arc was often seen spanning the distance between clouds and sea. And so the goddess Iris was believed to replenish the rain clouds with water from the sea. In myth, she appears only as an errant running messenger and is usually described as a virgin goddess. And her name contains a double meaning, the word for rainbow, Iris, and for messenger, Iris. She becomes the herald of Hera and seems to be wholly positive in contrast with her sisters, the Harpies, who are baleful daimons of sudden sharp gusts of wind. The Harpies may be dispatched in myth as hounds of Zeus to snatch away Harpazo, whatever people or things the god finds unseemly and sudden mysterious disappearances are often associated with the harpies, usually depicted as winged women with ugly faces and the lower bodies of birds. Although described as fair-cheeked, Cato and Forcus seem to be the original sea monsters, as well as the grandparents of most of the Greek monsters. Hesiod ends his entire section on the Greek monsters with the statement, this is the brood of Forcus and Cato. In ancient mosaic, Forcus is depicted as a gray-haired, fish-tailed god with spiky crab-like skin and crab claw forelegs, often carrying a torch. Cato's name means whale or sea monster, and Forcus perhaps seal, from phokes in Greek. The most significant and mostly all bad lineage of monsters in Greek myth are the children of Forcus and Cato. First the Graiae, also described as fair-cheeked, although grey from birth, and who are called Graiae by both gods and men. Gods and men often having different names for the same thing in myth, and although usually there are three Graiae in later myth, Hesiod names only two, well-robed Pemphredo and saffron-cloaked Enyo. In Homer, Enyo seems to be less a Graiae and more a warrior goddess. Usually the third one is Daino, or the terrible from the Greek Danos, Enyo the warlike, and Pemphredo, she who guides the way. Invariably the Graiae are sea hags, or crones, grey from birth, and sometimes with the bodies of swans. We would likely know a lot more about them if Aeschylus' play, The Forcudes, or The Children of Forcus, had survived. The most famous myth of the Graiae concerns the Perseus legend, and we hear it also in Aeschylus, that the Graiae have a single, detachable eye and tooth. In the Perseus myth, they guard their sisters, the Gorgons, and so Perseus must blind them in order to get to the Gorgons and complete his quest. The second batch of children of Forcus and Cato are the Gorgons, who dwell beyond glorious Okeanus, at the Earth's end, towards night, by the clear-voiced Hesperides. Their names are Steno and Euryale, and the ill-fated Medusa, who was mortal, the first two Gorgons being ageless and immortal. Again, the location of the Gorgons' realm beyond Okeanus near the clear-voiced Hesperides is important in Hero Quest. And although the first two Gorgons are immortal, only their mortal sister, the ill-fated Medusa, becomes a star of myth. For it is Medusa's head, and its power to turn to stone, that Perseus, the son of Zeus and Danae, must fetch in his trial, which is guided by the patroness of heroes, Athena. Medusa's tale is very important, and so this justifies Hesiod in interrupting his tale with the words, Dark-maned Poseidon lay with one of the Gorgons, Medusa, on a soft meadow strewn with spring flowers. It's in all of its metamorphosis where we hear that Medusa was violated in Minerva's or Athena's shrine by the lord of the sea. Minerva turned away and covered with her shield her virgin eyes, and then for fitting punishment transformed the Gorgo's lovely hair into loathsome snakes. As most students of Greek mythology know, this is Zeus or Athena sanctioned victim blaming at its most appalling. Medusa is also interesting here because unlike the other, children of Forcus and Cato, she seems to be non-monstrous, and her fate the result of a victimization. The children of Medusa and Poseidon will also become very significant in myth, with the hero Perseus acting as a decapitating midwife. As Hesiod tells it, when Perseus cut off Medusa's head, immense Chryseor and the horse Pegasus sprang forth. His name came from the springs of ocean, 
by which he was born, but Chryseors from the golden sword he carried in his hand. Pegasus left the earth, mother of flocks, and flew away and reached the immortals. He lives in the palace of Zeus the counselor, to whom he brings thunder and lightning. In another key myth, Pegasus is tamed by Bellerophon and helps him in his battle against the Chimera, the Amazons, and the Solomoi. Pegasus seems to be a wholly good creature, combining the positive beauty of Medusa and her mother Cato with the stallion and celestial nature of Poseidon. Instead of frolicking around in the depth of the sea, his prerogative is to swim in the lofty air or ether, as well as to help Zeus-sanctioned heroes in their battle with the dark forces of the Chthonic and the monstrous feminine. Pegasus's brother, Chryseor, is a more obscure figure in Greek myth. Sometimes depicted as a boar with wings, he's also said to have emerged with the greatest of golden swords, from which he gets his name. Although we don't know much about Chryseor, Hesiod next tells us that Chryseor lay with Celeroe, an Oceanid, to sire three-headed Geriones, whom the might of Heracles slew. And he also slew Orthos, more on him in a minute. Gurion is thus most famous as a monstrous shepherd with a fabulous herd of cattle, whose coats are stained red by the light of the sunset. Of course, stealing these cattle is one of Heracles' twelve labors, and the significance of Gurion in this myth of the meaning of his name is unclear. It may be connected to the ancient word gay, the earth, or Guryo, singing. Here again, in providing a genealogical map of the children of Medusa and Poseidon, the textbook positively misreads Hesiod's poem. Remember, Hesiod had digressed into the myths of Pegasus, Chryseor, and Gurion, before returning to the children of Forcus and Cato, above all the queen of the monsters, Echidna. It is from the mating of Echidna and Typhon that we get all the most familiar Greek monsters, including Kerberos, the Hydra, the Chimera, the Sphinx, and the Nemean Lion. Echidna, the mother and the queen of the monsters, is one of the most psychologically significant figures in Greek myth, and the third child of Forcus and Cato. Cato bore another invincible monster in no way like mortal men or the deathless gods. In other words, a complete anomaly. Yes, in a hollow cave she bore Echidna, divine and iron-hearted, half fair-cheeked and bright-eyed nymph, and half huge and monstrous snake inside the holy earth, a snake that strikes swiftly and feeds on living flesh. Of course, for the Greek way of thinking, the most unclassifiable monster of them all would just have to be a gorgeous nymph with the body of a serpent and a total man-eater. Her lair is a cave under a hollow rock far from the immortal gods and mortal men. But note how the gods respect Echidna in declaring a glorious dwelling for her there. Her home is called Arima, beneath the earth, and it's the stronghold of the grisly Echidna, the nymph who is immortal and ageless forever. In other words, Echidna is also the sexiest of the Greek monsters. They say that this bright-eyed maiden lay in love with Typhon, remember, either the child of Gaia or of Hera and the king of the monsters. Typhon, that lawless and dreadful ravisher, and impregnated by him, she bore a harsh-tempered brood. The four children of Echidna and Typhon are the most recognizable monsters. First she gave birth to Orthus, who became the dog of Geriones, and then she bore a stubborn and unspeakable creature, Kerberos, the fifty-headed dog of Hades. Kerberos, that mighty and shameless eater of raw flesh, whose bark resounds like bronze. Note Hesiod's continued insistence here on eating raw flesh versus cooked, and associating the eating of raw flesh with savage, elemental, and pre-civilized monster deities. Echidna and Typhon's third child was the loathsome Hydra of Lerna, who was nurtured by white-armed Hera, whose wrath at mighty Heracles was implacable. Foster mothering, foster mothering potential allies in her struggle against Zeus, or even potential enemies like Thetis, seems to be one of Hera's major pastimes in Greek myth. Of course, in the end, Athena helps Heracles to slay the Hydra. Next, Echidna and Typhon bore the Chimera, mighty, dreadful, huge, and fleet-footed, who breathed forth a ceaseless stream of fire. The Chimera had three heads, one of a glowering lion, another of a goat, yet another of a savage dragon. Her front was a lion, her back a dragon, and her middle a goat. Pegasus and noble Bellerophon slew her. Other than the three rather than fifty heads of Kerberos, here are some more accurate images of the first four children of Echidna. After another digression, Ceto last lays in love with Forcus again and bears their youngest child, a ghastly snake that guards the all-golden apples on the island of the Hesperides. Lurking in his lair in the gloom of Earth's vast limits, Hesiod doesn't name this last child, but he tends to be identified with Ladon or the Hesperian dragon. 
and before discussing the very interesting Sphinx and the Nemean Lion, we should pause here to note that the generations of Greek monsters is as well structured by the myth of succession, from the Titans to the Olympians. The first generation of Greek monsters, children of Pontos and Gaia, may be all good, like Nereus and the Fifty Nereids, or may be a mixture of good and bad, like Iris and the Harpies. They may be mostly all bad, but necessary for the structure of the cosmos, such as the Graii or Ladon, or potentially even quite good, like Medusa, at least before her transformation. This first generation we could say are the titanic monsters, and this second generation a bit like the Olympians, but in the realm of the sea. Again, note how the textbook neglects putting Echidna on this first list, but she's definitely there. And recall how the Olympians, in shoring up their rule, go on to produce another generation of deities. Gods like Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Dionysus, or Hermes, what we might call the second generation of Olympians, who are not bent on overthrowing the Olympian order, but rather support and sustain it. Similarly, it is the children of Echidna and Typhon who serve this function of being third-generation monsters. The narrative arc of Olympian progress moves from good to better, we could say, and that of the generations of the sea from best to worst. And it's interesting here that while incest is a major motif in Olympian procreation, it seems to occur only once in the generation of the monsters. And these are the children of Echidna and her son Orthos, the Nemean Lion and the Theban Sphinx. Next, Orthos covered her, a euphemism for coupling, and she bore the destructive Sphinx, a scourge for the descendants of Cadmus, and then the Lion of Nemea, who was reared by Hera and settled on the hills of Nemea as a scourge to mankind. Hera again foster-mothering monsters for the purpose of subduing Heracles, Zeus's favorite mortal son. Of course, the strength of mighty Heracles subdued him. Athanasicus notes how paradoxically little is said about the Sphinx in Hesiod, even though her place in Greek art and mythology is very prominent. She is definitely of Egyptian origin, although in her Greek manifestation she has a woman's head and a lion's body, as well as the wings of an eagle. In contrast, the Egyptian Sphinx is often male and lack the accoutrement of wings or sometimes a serpent's tail. Again, Hera seems to be the background power or meddler whenever it comes to the children of her son Tophios, and she sends the Sphinx to Thebes, where it becomes a local menace, devouring one group of men after another, all of whom fail to solve her riddle. The Sphinx herself is either killed or commits suicide only after Oedipus solves her riddle, and we'll get much more into this myth of Oedipus and the Sphinx in our unit on the Theban saga. Athanasicus concludes by noting that the enigmatic later Sphinx, whom the tragic poets call the Wise Virgin, seems to be a far cry from the dreadful daughter of Echidna in Hesiod. So that being the main lineage of Greek monsters in Hesiod's Theogony, the last question we have to address this week is the intimate relation between the last generation of monsters and the Greek heroes. This mysterious symbolic relationship indeed seems to be determinative for the entire history of Western culture. The battle of Bellerophon and Pegasus with the Chimera eventually morphing into St. George's slaying of the dragon. And we have to ask what is the meaning of the hero's encounter with and slaying of the monster. Here we can turn to Jean-Joseph Gou's excellent book Oedipus Philosopher and his use of the trifunctional hypothesis in the French linguist Georges Dumézil as the most viable theory that can help us to understand the meaning of Greek monster myth. Dumézil's trifunctional hypothesis begins from the observation that in all Indo-European languages and societies, we can observe the persistence of a threefold class or caste structure consisting of priests, warriors, and commoners. Religiously, these three castes map onto three functional domains. The priest overseeing the sacred function, the warriors the martial function, and the commoners the domain of productive fertility, or the economic function. Very often, different types of sovereignty are shared out among the priests and the warriors, and so Dumazil speaks of the ruling function of sovereignty as having two basic parts. A juridical, priestly, or natural sovereignty, often in harmony and sometimes at loggerheads with a more powerful, unpredictable, or supernatural sovereignty. This division of the very concept of sovereignty is most clearly visible for Dumazil in the Vedic gods Mitra and Varuna, but we can still see something of this distinction in the rule of Zeus, associated with peace, justice, truer or higher nature, and the previous rule of Kronos. Of course, in the Greek model, both these functions of sovereignty are fused into Zeus, but they can still be distinguished 
in the individual myths concerning this god and other deities in Greek myth and religion. Now here's where the Greek monsters come in. In addition to there being a clear concept of legitimate sovereignty, usually divvied up between the priests and the warrior class, between the sacred and the martial function, there are as well many representations of monstrous sovereignty. And here, monstrous multiformed animals have always been used in the context not only of hero quest, but also to represent the sovereign himself. Just think of the Sphinx of Gaza, who is imagined as the very senses of the pharaoh. In the Oedipus myth, the Sphinx itself and Oedipus's success or failure to truly vanquish her in her riddle becomes a symbol of the monstrosity of Oedipus's own rule on account of the incest with the mother or evasion of the sacred. Now, according to Gu, we can analyze every hero in Greek mythology, including most all of the trials they undergo, in terms of the basic relation of the hero to the three functions. Each hero is paired with a particular type of monster, where we can symbolically analyze the particular monstrous components of that monster in terms of that particular hero's ordeal, or even sin, tragic flaw, or harmarsha. The encountered shadow monster is in short an anima image of the hero's own soul before having completed its rite of passage, invariably involving a slaying of the monster or overcoming of a difficulty in the functional domain. The hero's harmarsha or tragic flaw can be symbolically mapped onto the particular monster with which that hero is paired. The fact that not all Greek monsters have three monstrous parts is not an objection to this way of reading the symbolic meaning of the monster because it's not a given that the hero will have a problem that must be overcome in each of the three functional domains. In the context of Greek hero quest, the fight with and vanquishing of the monster is ever an episode in what Joseph Campbell called the monomyth. In its most pared down and schematic outline, most all Greek hero myth seems to follow a common narrative form. First, a king fears a younger man. Next, the future hero escapes the king's murderous intentions often with the help of a second or dispatcher king who cannot bring himself to commit the crime. And so he assigns a perilous task in which the future hero is expected to lose his life. Most commonly, this trial takes the form of a fight with a monster, where the hero succeeds in defeating the monster, not on his own, but with the help of a god or multiple gods, or perhaps a wise man or a future bride. Finally, the hero triumphs over the monster which allows him to marry the daughter of the king, thus unleashing the power of the bride and creating that illusion of a happily ever after ending, which as you'll recall also structured the end of Hesiod's Theogony in regards to the perpetuity of the Olympian order after its victory in the Gigantomachy. While we can't expect the heroes of Greek myth to be up to the task of defeating a monster like Typhon, they may on occasion be up to the task of a more localized victory, thus in a way assisting Zeus in the maintenance of his Olympian order and imitating Zeus's own hero's journey to the position of greatest god in the pantheon. Now setting aside Heracles, due to the complexities of his myth, Gu turns next to similarities and differences between the other best-known Greek heroes, Oedipus, Perseus, Bellerophon, and Jason. First noting that all four heroes are brought up under the protection of a foreign and less threatening king, they as well all confront a dangerous monster and emerge victorious. The Chimera is slain by Bellerophon, the Sphinx, vanquished by Oedipus, and the Colchis Dragon, defeated by Jason, are all children of the Snake Woman, Echidna. Medusa, who Perseus decapitates, is a first-generation child of Forcus and Cato. In fact, the Colchian Dragon is a child of Gaia and Typhon and Apollonius Rhodes, but Hyginus does list Echidna as his mother so close enough. The next similarity is that in each of these four victories achieved over the monster leads the hero to marriage. Perseus marries Andromeda, Bellerophon marries Philonoe, Jason marries Medea, and Oedipus marries Jocasta. And so all four hero myths involve at the end a royal investiture and the taking possession of a kingdom. The next major similarity with just one exception, Oedipus, is that all Greek heroes can only emerge victorious in the trial and combat with the monster only on account of the help of one or more gods. Perseus is assisted by Athena, who teaches him how to tell Medusa from the other two Gorgon sisters. Athena also gives him a polished shield, instructing him never to look at Medusa, but only at her reflection. And Hermes, for his part, arms Perseus with a sharp steel sickle. Similarly, when Bellerophon is preparing to capture Pegasus for his attack on the Chimera, Athena brings him the golden bridle that will allow him to control the winged horse. 
Jason, too, is aided by Athena at the start of his long journey when she fits an oracular beam into the prow of his ship, the Argos, and Jason's expedition benefits from Hera's patronage throughout. Here, as Goo notes, only Oedipus goes it alone without the help of any god. And we'll have to look more closely into this anomaly later. In answer to the question of what is the meaning of this scene in the monomyth, we can answer that it is two things basically, matricide and misogyny. Here Gu notes that monstricide is the great unthought element of Freudian psychoanalysis, and that the schism which shook psychoanalysis at its very outset, that is Freud's break with the heretic Jung, is not unrelated to this issue. Freud for his part had a tendency to place patricide at the origin of the civilizing process and thus the name of the father. In Totem and Taboo, he imagined with James Fraser that originally societies were organized around the tribal chieftain or father of the horde, who kept all the women and sired all the children himself. His sons eventually banding together in a fraternal order to slay the father and establish at least for a time a more egalitarian space where power was more evenly distributed. Like in the longing of the son to slay the father and marry the mother in the Oedipus complex, Freud came to see the schism with the father as the source of all of our distinctively Western psychological maladies. But according to Jung, the hostility towards the father in myth and religion is just one archetype among another, perhaps even deeper archetype, having to do with the mother rather than the father complexes. In fact, the discovery of the Babylonian Enuma Elish has stunningly borne out Jung's insight here. In that tale, the original goddess mother Tiamat is at first beneficent but turns monstrous and becomes the mother of monsters. When her consort Apsu is slain by the younger generation of gods, the rage of the monstrous mother knows no bounds and this is in Babylonian myth the scene of the battle of the gods. Some siding with Tiamat but most with a male-led younger generation. As it turns out, Marduk is the only one who can triumph over Tiamat. And so in order to preserve order and civilization, most of the gods team up with Marduk who kills the mother goddess Tiamat and distributes her body parts to make up the physical cosmos that we observe. Here it is definitely matricide and not patricide that constitutes a founding myth of Western civilization. These subject matters would take a very long treatment, but for our purposes looking into the Greek monsters we can say that they have much more to do with emulating the father, above all father Zeus, and with putting the maternal or feminine principle in its place through matricide than to any kind of desire for the mother and wish to slay the father. And here Gu notes that Jung was not mistaken to remain intransigent in his quarrel with Freud, for no concept in Freudian doctrine could come to terms with the monster. And Jung, seeking the meaning of this dangerous creature, Echidna, was right to look to the mother, to the dark, enveloping, stifling mother, who binds and captivates her son, holds him back, and traps him in the numberless coils of her reptilian attachment. In Freudian terms, this is the phallic mother, and it comes to be associated in Jung's way of thinking with Echidna and with the brood of Forcus and Cato in general. In fact, according to Jung, poet Hesiod's overall view on the feminine is defined by a negative relation to what he called the anima image, that is the feminine principle in the psyche of the man, which often goes unexpressed, but is in fact the core of the personality. Hesiodic and in general all Greek hero quest defined by the attempt to overcome and vanquish the phallic mother, thus joining the mystical and political society of men through rites of passage or initiatory matricide. And thus for Jung, according to Gu, matricide is the great unsought element of Freudian doctrine. To confirm how the motif of matricide or monstricide corresponds to Dumazil's three functions, we could analyze each hero and his respective shadow beast or monster in turn but the monstrous sphinx provides the clearest confirmation of the hypothesis. Gu goes on, the sphinx, as some myth tells us, consists of three components. The head of a woman, corresponding to the sexual function, the body of a lion, to the martial function, and the wings of an eagle, corresponding to the sacred. So it is clear that without pushing the mythological data too far, we can connect each of these three parts with one of Dumazil's three functions. The woman is the seductive component corresponding to the sexual trial. The lion's body is related to the values of warrior-like strength proper to the second function, war. And as for the eagle's wings, through their affinity with the heavens and the animal associated with Zeus, they constitute a no less clear symbol of the first function, that is, of the mysteries of the sacred. On this idea of a triple trial in hero myth, 
Ludwig Leisner had already observed more than a century ago that the mythical or legendary demons of Greek myth tend to impose three types of trials on their victims. Trial by caresses, trial by blows, or trial by questions. And these again correspond to the three functional domains. Agricultural or sexual fertility, war, or the enigmatic character of the sacred. The trial by caresses concerns sexual desire, the trial by blows, physical strength, and the trial by riddling enigmas give the hero an opportunity to prove his intelligence, or Zeus-like mind, noose. Amazingly, this way of symbolically interpreting monster myth, in terms of something similar to Dumazil's three functions, also turns up in Plato's Republic, especially when he writes that the human soul resembles one of those natures that the ancient fables tell of, as that of a chimera or scula or Kerberos, and the numerous other examples that are told of many forms grown together into one. The monstrous chimera in particular is in Plato the very image of the human soul, which he theorizes at length has three parts or is subject to a tripartite division, consisting of appetitive and spirited parts of the soul, as well as the rational part of the soul, which is given dominion over the other two, who comments that the polycephalic or many-headed beast is the part of the soul that is the seat of sensual desire, multiple and unlimited, and this is the concupiscent element. The lion is the irascible component, the fierce and audacious part that never ceases to aspire to domination and victory. But the human being itself signifies the wise and the rational element of the soul, the one that derives pleasure only from the knowledge of truth. In Plato's tripartite division of the soul, the monster shadow beast and its symbolic aspects become a symbol of the inner man himself, the structure of his psyche, the trials he must undergo, as well as hopefully a triumph in the end of the rational principle. The sea itself coming to be cast in the image of the monster in Greek mythical thought. With Plato, the triple monster, we might say the sea itself, has come to be internalized. Insofar as the human being follows the concupiscent or irascible elements, it becomes yet more monstrous like the teeming sea. But insofar as it lets itself be guided by reason and sacred sovereignty, the soul models itself more on Olympian intelligence, rather than the chimeras, skulas, and kerberuses of myth. In Plato's own version of a hero's quest, triumphing over the darkness, obscurity, or ambiguity of matter, and becoming the champion of the pure world of the forms, the soul or the psyche becomes the inner man himself, and even the chaotic or primeval sea itself. The sea as the ultimate image of the unconscious, and the mother of us all, as we've seen in Greek mythology, cast either in the images of light, play, and sovereignty, or in the images of a monster. Of course, the sea and its many deities and monsters has always found its way to restore its rights in the human orders of culture, civilization, and art. Although a tracing of the myths of the Greek sea in the later history of Western civilization will here be saved for a future lecture. Thanks for listening, everyone, and have a great week. Hopefully involving a trip to the ocean and a catapontismos into its glories rather than its murky deeps. Please don't slay any sea monsters, but rather learn to see them as reflections of one and the same soul of the sea, from which humanity first conceptualized its golden age, first origin and destiny of humanity. And don't forget to visit with Hoodling's poem, The Archipelagus, those glorious Greek islands from which all this sea mythology emerged. Good luck, and see you next week.